Can you believe it's Tuesday? Can you believe it's Tuesday? Candle makers happy hour. It's going to be sick today. I just want you to know I've lined up some pretty good stuff today. We're going to talk about three things that I believe every new candle maker should do. And I'll talk about what they are and why I think it's true. It's going to be a great show. I'm, I'm happy you're all joining me. So uh, let's jump right in. I hope that you have something to drink, something to keep yourself entertained, either hydrated or in some cases dehydrated, though having a happy hour on a Tuesday, <laughs> who knows. I've been made aware my Instagram connection is relatively weak, so I apologize to all of you. Uh, bear with me. If you need to catch the replay, YouTube is definitely the place to go, but it will be posted on Instagram as well. So if you're not following or if you want to follow, that'll be at Instagram, <laughs> at Armitage Candle Company. No spaces, no dashes, nothing like that. Armitage Candle Company, just like I got, there's links everywhere. So today we're going to talk about advice and selfishly, I will say that all the advice that I'm going to give is really just advice I wish I had. When I first started out, I think this is good advice for getting into the craft, learning the craft, learning how to sell, learning your identity as a candle maker and figuring out just how does all this stuff go together and what am I going to do with it? And so my journey into candle making, honestly, I was walking down an aisle at a store and I saw the price of a candle and I said, Holy cow, that candle is like, it's like 25 bucks. Like there's no way that it costs $25 to make it. I bet I could, if I learned it and I made my own candles, I bet I could turn a pretty good profit or I could at least, at the very least, save a lot of money. And, and so I set out on this adventure and learned and I made a candle and my first candle honestly was horrible. <laughs> I was like, okay. Maybe there's a little more to this whole thing than I thought. Well, here's the honest truth. You can make mediocre candles with mediocre effort. It's not hard. It's really not hard to make a candle, a mediocre candle. But to make a good candle, you really need a lot more than that. You need to study a little bit. You need iterations. You need repetition. And so the advice here kind of is speaking to an early version of myself, an early version of Armitage Candle Company when it started out. So let's dive in. First piece of advice, make 80 candles and give almost all of them away for free. Make 80 candles, give almost all of them away for free. And the reason for that is there's so much to unpack in that. Well, first of all, why 80? I believe 80 candles is really the benchmark for getting over the hump of how to make a candle. And you're not going to be an expert after making 80 candles, but 80 candles will equip you with, with time and energy that you put into the craft. I believe after 80 candles, you have an understanding a little bit of how to put a candle together Everything from supplies to technique to curing, maybe to testing, but we'll talk about that. The other thing is that you, you can't make 80 candles with a candle making kit. Because the kit only, usually they only give you a pound or two of wax. You can't make, well, you can't make 80 decent candles out of that. You can make 80 tiny little micro candles out of that. But the idea there, and there's nothing wrong with candle making kits, but I think that I think that it's important to give candle making an honest try. Like a, if, if you just stick with the candle making kit and you don't, and you don't uh, invest in supplies and you don't invest in equipment, then you don't really get an honest look at the craft. 80 candles means that you have to buy some supplies. You have to source a wax and some containers and, you may even, if, if you're really kind of getting into it, you may even pay a little more and get some better equipment. Double boilers are great, um, but 
and actually a lot of people still use the double boiler, but 80 candles requires you to, to take it upon yourself to maybe up your game a little bit. So I think, I, I believe strongly that there's a lot of people that start candle making and they quit because they just, honestly, they struggled because their equipment sucked. I think it's a good idea to, to do the 80 mark to invest a little in your equipment. That way the excuse for leaving, which might be the right thing to do, but the excuse for leaving isn't because your equipment was bad because that's, that's really not an honest look at the craft. So you get a better taste of that. And the reason you give all 80, almost all 80 away is because it removes the distraction of selling your candles. If you've spent any time in the community or you've talked to other people, some people just want to sell candles and they sit and that's their objective. Well, if, if you, if you go in without that, then you can focus on just getting better at the candles. You can make a mediocre candle and sell it and it works. It's not sustainable. It's not necessarily good practice. It's not necessarily a good representation of our industry, but you can do it. And so the advice of 80 without selling is to remove that as your focus. That way you're not like trying to shortcut your way to a product or at that point, I'll say a commodity that you can sell. You're giving them away to people and generally you, you may even do really care about the quality a lot more if you're giving it to people too. But the point is that remove that as the shortcut, remove that as the distraction, just focus on creating candles, just getting better at the technique, all of that. So what 80, what 80 should you make? What does that, what does 80 even mean? Well, my encouragement there, my advice on the 80 is try out a lot of things. Try a lot of different fragrances so you can see the impact of different fragrances on your candle. Try a few different wicks. Try different containers. If you're doing container candles, I'd say also try making, go a little outside your comfort zone. Maybe try making a pillar or some wax melts. Get a little taste, at least get a taste of everything you think you might be interested in right away. Like there's enough, uh, fine, there's enough of the finer points to candle making that you can really give a lot of things a shot and maybe <laughs> if you like intent on making a soy wax candles in the future try making a paraffin just so that you can understand that little part so 80 candles and put as much spice and variety into that as it makes sense for what you're doing so that's my first piece of advice. Make 80 candles and give almost all of them away. But why almost all of them? I think that it's important also that in this phase, you also learn to test. You need to learn to test your candles, not only for their performance, how well they smell, but I think it's, it's a good idea to figure out how to make a safe candle. And there's a lot of resources out there. There's tons of resources, and a lot of them are really good on how to test your candles. I, I happen to have some of my own that I freely share with the community, anyone who wants it. But learning the basics of candle testing and what works and what you need to look for and how you adjust, I think that's a very valuable skill, especially if your focus is to go into sales and to make candles that you can sell to someone else. So the ones that you don't give away, burn for yourself. And in some of those, if not all of them, test them. This is the, my quick plug on testing is you can get a free testing template that tells you how to, what markers to look for and how long to burn. And it's specifically for container candles. I know that that's generally the most popular and it pulls in the industry standard requirements, but it also has a few other things to look for. And if that interests you in any way, if not just to copy paste it into your own, you can get that for free by going to Armitage Candle Company slash burn test, burn hyphen test, and it's yours. Along with an entire library of other freebies that are yours as well. Okay, so second piece of advice, stay organized in a way that works for you. We are all designed differently. We all respond to 
emotions differently. We, some of us are emotionless. My wife may say that I'm emotionless sometimes, but the deal is because we all have differences. I don't want to encourage you to take notes or label your candles or test the way that I do. I would say find a system that works for you. So uh, staying organized in a way that works for you covers a few categories of candle making. It first covers, I'll say, the way that you record your processes, the way that you know that you were successful or the way that you would consider that what I'll say a learning opportunity <laughs> or a failure, to be blunt. And recording that, like for me, that means taking notes of when I added my fragrance and when I poured the candle and the room temp. Very basic temperature management, I'll call it. And I take those notes so that I can learn from candle to candle. The other thing to stay organized is the way that you label your candles. When I got started, I got carried away. I made all these candles and then I came back to them the next day. I didn't even know. I didn't even know which one was which. So I learned very quickly. Like if I could give myself advice, I would have said put painter's tape, best possible label for, for testers, painter's tape, and put it right right on the painter's tape, put that right on the label. Peels right off, no problem. Uh, my first iteration was like Avery white sticker labels that I'm pretty sure I could find one right now over here that still has it on because I can't pull them off. They're super hard to, to pull off. I know you can soak them in water, but just so much work. Um, so yeah, label, label everything you make. Label every single thing you make. I think that's a good way to stay organized at least so you have an understanding of what the heck is coming out of your shop. And if you're following the 80 candle rule, then that certainly is going to become into play because you won't know what fragrances or when you poured it, yada, yada, yada. And then record how you're doing things. Um, for instance, I, if you use a double boiler, make note of that. This came out of a double boiler method. Or if you find something that really doesn't work, Write that down too. I think for me, I was stirring with, I can't remember what it was when I started out, but I was introducing a lot of air, which I didn't think was a problem. I didn't realize how much of a problem introducing air into your blend was because you pour it and it's still got the air and it causes some issues. So uh, write things down that don't work or just don't do them. Somehow in your mind, you need to, to know that. So it's not a crazy deep piece of advice, but I think it's really important is that staying organized. And the reason is you want to be consistent in your successes and you want to quickly ditch your failures. So understanding those through the power of note taking or organizational methods, I think is really critical, especially to, to find an, a successful avenue in candle making. All right. Third piece of advice. And I think this one is, is golden. I think this is the best advice I could possibly give. And this covers not only people who want to sell candles, but people who are just learning how to make them or have been making them for a few months and they're starting to think in their brain. But here it is. Don't worry about Yankee Candle. Don't worry about Bath and Body Works. Don't worry about what you find at Walmart or what you find at Target. People are like, oh my gosh, I, how, can I, how can I expect my candle to be as good as that. I might as well just not make candles. Or how can I price my candles competitively when they're selling them? A one for like eight bucks. Like, what's the deal? How am I supposed to, to reconcile that? Why would I ever get into it? Who's ever going to pay for this? Who's ever going to want to burn this unless I give it to them when you've got companies that are able to just pump these things out and and, you know, they're all going to outdo me every time. Well, here's a couple myths about that. Myth number one is that they are lesser quality because they're lesser price. Here's the honest truth. It's hard to grapple with, but those Bath and Body Works candles, those Yankee candles, what I call grocery store candles, things you find in a grocery store, very made in, in huge bulk quantity. The truth is they actually burn pretty well. 
they burn just fine. Um, we like to tell ourselves or other people will say, don't worry about them. And they'll, they'll always show that same picture. This, this is a Yankee candle. It's so bad. Like you guys are fine. Here's the deal. Yankee candles, bath and body works. I have a few bath and body works candles. They're actually made pretty well. <laughs> they go through pretty stringent quality control. They are able to repeat their processes. They're controlling their entire environment, humidity and temperature. And they're cranking those things out. Yeah, but they're cranking them out pretty much the same every time. And they're getting good. And they, they've they made so many, they're able to improve this. And they have a powerful marketing department and all this. So so what's the deal? Like, why, why even compete with that? Well, what, what those companies are making is what I call a commodity, right? Behind that candle is nothing more than a candle. You're buying a candle. The difference between them and us, most of us, is we are making art. That's what I think. I think we're making art. And the reason what distinguishes a commodity from art is this. When you buy Yankee Candle, when you buy uh, Bath and Body Works, you're buying, you're paying for the candle. When you're buying or burning our candles, you are receiving a story, a design. There's meaning behind what we're creating. These are handcrafted. People like that. The world economy has gotten to a point where we're able to crank out commodities of all types super easy. And we've gotten those prices way down. You, you can only make things so cheap. And eventually you'll find great candles for $2. But they're made in such mass quantity. We're shifting into an art-centric culture. People want something with a story, something with meaning, something that was made by you by hand or in small batches by your team. That's people want to pay for that. They'll, they will pay more for that. So don't be afraid to price a little higher. Don't be afraid to compete because the honest truth, you're not competing with them. You have a different market. You're, you're not going to compete unless you work for Yankee Candle right now. You're not going to compete with them. They have different people that they're selling to. And we need to find our people, and it's a little different for everybody. We need to tell them our story, make them a promise with what's coming out, because this isn't just a candle. If you want a candle, go to go to the grocery store or go to the, the candle store, the, the mega candle store. That's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But we're looking for an audience that treasures our work and treats it as art, because that's what we're doing. So don't wrestle with, oh my gosh, there's big companies out there that are making these candles for cheap. Don't don't worry about them. Don't worry about them. It's only going to put you in a position where you feel lesser, but you're not. You're, you're putting time and energy in, and people want to pay for what you're doing. I think you're all doing great work. So that's my third piece of advice. It's really more, I won't even say it's motivational, but it is, it's a truth that I think that if we can accept that and learn that, especially as beginners starting out, not to worry about those things, then it really, it, it gives us more confidence to understand that your people are out there. They want what you're making. And, and when you're finally at a place where you're able to, to create that for them, to give them that experience, to give them that journey, to make that promise and deliver on it, then you'll find your tribe and, and you'll lock in with them and they'll come back. And, and that's what I have to say. So um, Q&A, if anybody's got any questions, now is the time to ask. Yes, absolutely. It's a labor of love. Yes, I love that. That's a great way to put it. So um, another quick mention, I, the burn test template is yours for free. Go to armitagecandlecompany.com slash burn test. There's also a note-taking template if you're like, oh, I should stay organized, but I don't know how, and I don't know what to, what to write down. I've got you covered. There's another template on the website as well for you. If you're, if you're watching a replay, the, the link is in the description for that as well. But that's at armitagecandlecompany.com slash notes.
It's a PDF. You can use it. If not for inspiration, I've always, I, how many of us are giving, are uh, getting these free things and we're like, eh, it's not really for me, but I like some of what's in there. That could be this for you. I'm not offended. I just want you to find something valuable to help you out. And that's the truth. That's what actually Armitage Candle Company was built on. It's the it's the resource I wish I had when I was starting out. Even when I was a few months deep and I felt like I knew what was going on, I still have questions. I Today, I still have questions. Um, speaking of questions, here we go. Instagram, should you put a lot of work into naming candles? Well, I think so. I think that the name is a great place for you to express your creativity and to tell a little bit of a story about what that candle is. And I think that the name also... It's okay to name it after the fragrance oil or the fragrance that it is. And I think that that's actually pretty appropriate in some cases. For me, I like to to draw inspiration from the fragrance and try to tell a story. Um, a while ago, I had a candle that was using the, the library scent from Candle Science, pretty popular. And I was like, eh, I don't really want to call it library. If you go to Etsy, you'll see like a thousand libraries. So I named it Pages. <laughs> not not all that creative, but it is like different than that. And I have a little tagline on there. It's the whole thing. Um, but I did that as inspiration for that. So I think name is a good place to to really to push it. And if your brand is focused on something else, then the name is a hook into that to be a subplot of the story of your company and what you're doing. Great question. Uh, another question here. When should I put the wick in after pouring the candle wickless? That's great. I just did a video on wickless candle testing. And I believe that as long as the candle is cooled, you can put the wick in. So that could be 24 hours. Even if you want to cure it longer, you can put that wick in earlier. And I think that that works just fine. I, I personally haven't had many problems with doing it that way. So that's kind of what I do. Made a candle Sunday. I haven't put the wick in yet because it needs to cure right. I think that absolutely fine. Uh, another way you could do it, actually I do this too, is I I label it <laughs> with the wax and the date. And I have a, I don't even want to admit this publicly, but I have a candle calendar <laughs> to tell me when things are ready. Because I like to have things in flight. I don't like, I'm not patient. I don't like waiting. So I try to always have those things going. Uh, but on my calendar, candle calendar, I'll know that candle with this, I always have an ID too. So on the ID, I will then add the wick that I intend to test right before doing the test or like maybe a day before doing the test, but right at that moment. So I can make the decision at that moment because sometimes I've got other candles, same blend and everything that I already tested a wick in. So getting ahead of myself, if I'm kind of regularly testing, I'll do it right before. So I hope that helps. Um, but I think that really you can put it in as long as it's hard because the curing process will continue and you're, you're simply inserting a wick. You're only taking out, you're taking out wax, not adding any. So you shouldn't have to worry. I wouldn't worry about um, anything there going sideways. When will my candles be ready for purchase? Ooh. Great question. Here's the deal. I'm going to be launching Q4 sometime in November. Stay tuned. The best place to look for that, if you care, is going to be through my email list, which you can get on at Armitage Candle Company. Instagram, there will be promotions as well. But if you want the inside scoop, join my email list. You can do that if you've gotten any of the freebies, but you can also just do it by going to the website. It's all over the place. Um, and if you sign up, you get a bunch of bunch of crap and you might think it's crap, but that's fine. I don't, I think it's actually valuable stuff. I think it's good. Um, and that candle collection will be extremely limited, extremely limited. So you'll have to get in on the front end. Great question. So here we go. How can you determine the correct ratios of making your candles and or do you have classes available for first time makers? So the first half of that ratios, I'm assuming that's if you're building out a collection, how many of each 
candle, individual candle type in that collection should you make? That's a hard one to judge. Uh, for me, I, I'm a data driven person. So I'll start with a risk free amount, an amount that I'm okay with selling zero of if it comes to that. And then if if they all sell, that tells me, well, I should restock maybe with a little more, depending on how long it took. If they don't, if they do all sell, but it took a year, then that one's probably not coming back. But if they all sell right away, they do that. And I do that to balance my risk. If I don't create more than I can afford to lose on, then I don't have to worry about it. But if I make a bunch and I'm expecting to sell and nothing sells, then like I just took a big L on that. And I either give them away or burn them myself. But um, I would say manage your risk, understand your people, and just build data, take take baby steps. It's easy to want to build out that massive line, but um, scarcity is a good thing. Scarcity is a good thing, um, and it could protect you. All right. Uh, oh, classes? I'll just say this. Stay tuned. Stay tuned. Do you think using 10% fragrance load is a waste of money? Maybe, um, maybe 10% is the magic number where you're getting the performance that you want out of that candle. I start with six to eight, depending on the wax. Uh, my, my palm wax only holds like three, <laughs> does great, fills a room. Um, and 3% is great there too. Uh, stay tuned to my video coming out Thursday. If, if you're from the future watching a replay, it's already out. But it's a video all about how to optimize your hot throw and getting that massive, powerful hot throw comes down to balancing and understanding the role of fragrance oil in your candle. The teaser on that is this, that there's two things. Fragrance oil is the source of the smell. The candle is the delivery system. The, the part that's actually getting the fragrance, the smell out in the air is not the fragrance oil itself, but it does impact it. I say it all the time. Everything added to a candle impacts everything added. Not, fragrance oil is not an exclusion to that. So the, the answer to your question is 10% might be fine, but 6% might be okay too. And the only way to know is to test, <laughs> is to test. I mean... I have a candle in my private collection that is a 10% load. At lower amounts, I didn't get the throw that I was looking for. So I boosted it. And this was actually in my earlier days where I was like, oh, add more. Adding more is not necessarily the answer. So that's what I'll say about that. I'd say if you're not sure, just make one. Make a half candle if you need to and give that a shot. Give that a whirl. Hope that helps. Um, I think that's all we have for today. Um, but I appreciate each and every one of you. It was a wonderful, if not a little quick, candle makers happy hour. Stay tuned. It's going to be great. I hope that you have a wonderful week. I hope you make beautiful candles. And I will see you in the next episode. Bye, everyone.